Education upended, reality setting in, the virus spreading fast, forcing Iowa students and teachers out of the building. Parents becoming worried, unsure of how their children would succeed. I can't replicate what the teachers are doing in the classroom. Teachers stepping up expanding rooms past the four traditional walls. I find that just me working with the kids one on one. They are so appreciative. School districts taking new approaches to keep students safe. We've worked hard and I think it's benefited our kids and our families. Coronavirus cause and effect. Iowa impact episode two. You're watching local five news. A homeschooling is one option some parents choose to educate their children, but this past year, pretty much everyone got a taste of what it was like to turn in the title of mom or dad for teacher, and it hasn't always been a smooth process. Here's Local 5's Elias Johnson. Okay, Collins up and Jets on deck. For the better part of a year, the Jaeger family home has served as a multi-purpose facility. Look, show me what you've done. Where's your computer? Where any suitable space for schoolwork doesn't go unused. Five-year-old crew prefers this spot. We don't do homework under our bed. Until dad brings him back to the kitchen table. You can do your worksheet that says I can be a friend. When the Urbandale Community School District went virtual last March, the only thing known about COVID-19 at the time was how fast it was spreading with little anyone could do to stop it. So the Jaegers, like most families, understood the need to keep kids at home. Oh my gosh, I cannot even get my brain to figure that one out. <laughs> you have to wait for your dad. But it hasn't always been easy for this family of six. A little bit chaotic. I mean, having four boys and ba balancing two jobs and everything's been just, like I said, chaotic. As more districts went back to offering classroom instruction full-time, Urbandale held out until the state mandated full-time class be offered as an option. I think we lost focus on the kids and it became more about other things from the board members to the parents to the school board. When it came down to my children being affected, their education, I can't replicate what the teachers are doing in the classroom. I'm, you know, not a teacher. I'm not a trained professional to do that. Trying to teach them, you know, this this math that they're trained to, to learn in a new lattice, you know, program. And it's like, oh, it's so much easier the way that I learned it, you know, so, or fractions. I'm sitting there like, trying to go to a tape measure, you know, like, okay, here's how you do it, but how do you explain to them? So yeah, the relearning on my end is, you know, kind of been crazy. It's almost like I'm going back to school. Beyond a screen, growing pains learning under one roof can also be found in the pantry. We've debated maybe putting a lock on our cabinets. <laughs> they haven't figured out the difference between being hungry and being bored. But there have been some bright spots. They're learning, you know, the technology side of it, which might help them down the road. And that precious time spent with their children, the Jaegers, will never get back. I do try to, you know, like say, Sarah, okay, you know, like it's, this is temporary, enjoy it, you know, cherish these times, whether they're stressful or challenging, because um, there's a lot worse things that we could be dealing with. And, you know, in the end, um, I'm very thankful that I can, you know, provide this for my kids, so. And that was Elias Johnson reporting. Some parents uh, were, wanted their kids to be in person in school no matter what. Some parents who never thought private school was in their future found themselves making the move and paying for it. Local 5 Sabrina Ahmed shares the length some families went. Tucked away upstairs in a craft room turned classroom. This second grader is one of three the usually busy house. I have a fourth grader, a second grader, and a pre-K. Is pretty quiet this morning and has been all year. Our fourth grader is at Bergman Academy. Our second grader is doing Des Moines hybrid program. And our preschool student is at St. Augustine's for their pre-K program. Yes, you heard her right. Lindy Nelson has three kids in three different school systems. It wasn't necessarily how she envisioned things going, but when the pandemic hit, she realized she needed to tend to each child's needs. Her daughter needs to be ready for kindergarten next year. A lot of her friends were going to St. Augustine's and we figured with the pandemic, if we could keep one thing consistent, and that would be her group of friends, that we were fine sending her to the Catholic schools. The older kids were a bit more complicated. Our second grader and our fourth grader, we wanted to keep of course, everyone together if we could, just for the sake of schedules, but our fourth grader um, 
wanted to look at Bergman Academy. And so we said that we would give that an opportunity and they did not have a second grade opening. That's a theme at Bergman Academy. So what's this year? I think this year has been a challenge and an opportunity. Families looking for a different environment. Since then, it has grown. Um, we have several grade levels that are full, a few that still have um, less, less open spaces. Bergman's only had a few handful of cases throughout the entire pandemic. Beginning in the summer, we put in place a plan of a required masking, of social distancing, of looking at our classrooms to see how can we navigate the space to make it healthy and safe as we can. Um, we took our already small classes and we divided them into even smaller classes. And we also did a lot with the environment, the ventilation, to make sure that we had as much airflow as we could. Ultimately though, we couldn't do it without the, the support of the families who are also being very thoughtful and very careful. Some of those changes only possible because this is a small private school which comes at a price. We do have some financial assistance for families. Um, we know that particularly with COVID, things are unexpected and changing and we don't want to never get to know a student because there's been an assumption uh, before picking up the phone and calling our admissions office. But giving each individual child access to the learning they need to thrive, Lindy says she was willing to do whatever it takes. It's just a matter of figuring out how it's going to work and relying on others. Not ideal, even chaotic. Thankfully, she has a flexible schedule. And truthfully, I will say it sounds like a lot, but it's been fine because we live in proximity to the schools. I can drop off, drop off and keep home. <laughs> she just tries to keep her attitude consistent. Positivity you know, go with the flow, and it is so much easier said than done, but our kids see it, our kids feel it, it portrays in ourselves and how we talk to others, and so this isn't going to last forever, and if we can just get through it in a positive way, that everybody will be better off, the kids, the parents, the whole household. Iowa State University data analyst Sarah Willett started tracking COVID data to keep herself sane. Well, each night we are giving you context of our focus for the episode. Tonight, it is about coronavirus in schools and what we know about transmission. Local 5's Holly Schlesselman shares the story of how one Iowan got involved to track everything we know about the virus and kids. Iowa State University data analyst Sarah Willett started tracking COVID data to keep herself sane. Then it turned into a job. I mean, I, I track the state's data because it's important and it's also the it, it's the master set of data where the school say school data is a subset but the school data that's my heart as a former educator will it found it was her personal responsibility to track COVID activity among iowa's education systems the iowa state education association offered a partnership in august and will it jumped aboard eventually bringing along iowa state students to help I somehow thought I could put 18 hours in, in a day and still sleep and still do my, my other job and still eat. And that was not true. Gathering school data is a different monster. Willett and her team have to hunt for school information that isn't always located on spreadsheets. Doing the school tracking, it's, it's almost seven days a week. Um, most districts report either one day a week some districts do Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Her team found that schools with mask mandates and other strong mitigation efforts had fewer outbreaks and schools with looser restrictions had more. Governor Reynolds ordered schools to shut down in April 2020, but by July, she was pushing for kids to be back in the classroom. But we have to be flexible, we have to think outside of the box, and we have to look at different um, alternatives. And so, you know, giving parents the option with kids that have underlying conditions or someone in the household that does to go 100% online, that's a parent's choice, and we most certainly should offer that. Using their data, Willa and her team are able to find out where the virus is spreading among kids and teachers. But under the current strain, transmission with kids that are 10 and under is pretty low from child to child. There's been research studies looking at that. Now, older kids, um, middle, middle and high schoolers, spread is pretty similar to, to adults. 
So it makes sense that kids and teachers have about the same amount of spread. But with a variant that can spread faster, Willett thinks we may see more transmission. With vaccination already underway, it's a waiting game to see if the variant will do that or not. Iowa did have a dashboard reporting positivity rates for school districts at one point, but the last update from nearly three weeks ago removed it from the website. Reporting in the studio, I'm Holly Slusselman, Local 5 News, we are Iowa. Finding new purposes in a previous job, why a former teacher has unretired at the request of neighbors. Next. Uh, this past year, learning gaps have gotten wider for kids in school with children who struggle in core subjects like reading and math falling further behind. One teacher who retired in the beginning of the pandemic has found a new purpose and classroom to those students catch back up. Here's Local 5's Elias Johnson. The kids can walk up here when we're writing to look at their transition words or how they want to start. Susie Mataloni retired from teaching elementary nine months ago. And so I have my printer, the pencil sharpener that the kids can get. But inside um, the basement of her Urbandale home, which now doubles as a classroom. I have just ordered what I needed to do it. You'd never know it. My last day in the classroom was the day before spring break. I never expected to be walking out of my classroom and never going back in again, but. When schools were ordered closed last March due to the pandemic and teaching went 100% virtual, learning gaps grew, especially for those needing extra help with foundational subjects like math and reading. So when a neighbor asked Ms. Mataloni for some tutoring help, one student quickly turned to eight. Just word of mouth and me running into people, I'm, I'm pretty busy, I'm pretty busy. Do, do we need the fraction circles? I'll bring, I'll bring them out, okay. Nixon is just one of her new students getting after school help with his own file and ongoing progress assessment. Today's focus, fractions, something Susie learned to track during her 32 years teaching. But it's a lot easier to do it now than just doing it at home by myself because like I turned it into the basket and I already know that I got it right. She's seeing scores improve, but often wonders how many more students are out there and don't know how far behind they've fallen. That's a really good question and I think it's dependent on each individual child and the type of time that those kids put in. I don't think you're going to see the full effects of what's going on probably six months to a year. Frustration falling behind from a student is one thing, but she says there's also a need to help parents who struggle even more. I feel really bad for all of the parents and the, what you are all trying to juggle. And so the parents, I think, are looking for that support, and I want to offer that support. <laughs> I had a really hard time writing that. I don't think I said everything correctly, but I'm going to miss you so much. I'm so proud of you. I'm gonna miss Watching a career she had for over three decades end in drive-by fashion like these also helped Thank reignite her passion because there's no better feeling than seeing one of her new students succeed. <laughs> Yay! You worked so hard on that. We had a couple, we worked on states and capitals last week. And the need to make up for lost time isn't going away anytime soon. There's nothing wrong with asking for help. No one is going to think any less of you as a parent if you're asking for help. Good parents ask for help. Elias Johnson, Local 5 News. Fraction part. The fraction part, good job. We are Iowa. Susie plans to grow her new support role, especially for parents, as long as it takes to get students caught back up. Well, every night we are honoring some of the unknown heroes of the pandemic, people you may have taken for granted over these days, but who were essential to us getting through it all. The head Waukee school nurse is one of those individuals, and Local 5's Jackie Schmillen reports how her world was turned upside down by coronavirus. My name is Joe Ramatka. I've been the lead nurse in the district now for about uh, seven years. I've been in the district for 20. This year, I'm the COVID nurse. Nurse Joe, as she's known, is quite the force in the Waukee Community School District. So our district made the commitment to have one person be that frontline person to talk to staff, talk to families about COVID, how it um, 
interacts with their students or any questions that they might have. So that that's what I do. When the district shut down in April and May, Nurse Joe didn't stop learning about the virus. I was fortunate enough way back in May when um, Tyson had some issues at their plant in Perry that Dallas County Public Health invited me over that we uh, for a week or two in May and I helped them do contact tracing making phone calls looking at situations talking about quarantines and isolations to people to the Tyson employees I learned a lot and nurse Joe took those practices and has helped Waukee schools function effectively even during a pandemic even helping set up seating charts for everything from the classroom to the cafeteria to the bus. We know where everybody sits. If we don't have pictures, we have a diagram of where kids sit. We keep track of that. But one of the most rewarding parts of Nurse Joe's job over the past several months has been the phone conversations with parents. The biggest thing that we do is we educate. We talk, 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 talk tell them what they what to look for, um, give them advice as to whether or not they need to get tested, um, talk about exclusions from school, because unfortunately there are times when we do have to ex exclude kids from school. The year hasn't always gone according to plan, but the team of nurses in Waukee have been the beating heart to making it run as smoothly as it can. We're, we've not been perfect, but boy, we've worked hard, and I think, I think, I think it's benefited our kids and our families. I, I think m most of them appreciate that their kids have been able to be in school. Jackie Schmellen, Local 5 News, we are Iowa. Oh boy, and thank you to all the nurses, both in schools and in local communities, helping keep us safe during the pandemic.